Hey everybody, it's Katie with Embody Daily, and today I'm here with Richard. Um, Richard is a filmmaker. He runs a podcast called Glitch in the Code, and he's also somebody who has struggled with alcoholism and alcohol use disorder. Um, I'm chatting with you today, Richard, because um, I know you went on the Sinclair Method for a little while, and you had kind of a unique experience with that, and now you are um, onto a different road to recovery. So. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share your story here with people because it's not um, the traditional, I guess, Sinclair method kind of story that I typically share on this channel. So just thank you so much for taking time to speak with me. That's okay, no problem. Um, yeah, I, I came across the Sinclair method for your, your work and Claudia's work. Um, so yeah, it's an honor to be talking to you and talking about the, the film that we'll be making as well together. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Richard and I are working on a documentary um, that will have to do with the different roads to recovery, including the Sinclair method and other um, approaches to it. So I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, I want to begin, Richard, I guess for you to just tell us a little bit about your, your history with alcohol and um, what it was like when you discovered the Sinclair method. My um, history with alcohol was a bizarre one because it was really did creep up on me. But I, from all the other recovery stories that I listened to, I hardly drunk anything compared to a lot of people. And I think that was really the, the most difficult thing for me to get my head around was that I was never a daily drinker. I was never a heavy drinker. I barely, I didn't hide alcohol around the house until the very end. Um, and, and you're talking a couple of days, like I, I, I was never a heavy drinker. I was a real binge drinker. I would drink. I actually drank more in my early twenties when I don't think I had a drink problem than I did when I think I had a drink problem because I was so in, trying so hard not to drink. Um, so for me, it was completely different. I feel like I kind of um, didn't drink hardly enough to, to say I had a drink problem, but I knew the way I was drinking, I had a drink problem. Um, especially towards the end. So really it was about 10 years ago. Actually, my drink problem started when I was 19, when I got beat up, I got, I got attacked outside the nightclub and um, really badly. And that kind of really, what, from what I know now is PTSD or PTSR as my friend Richard Grannon talks about um, response instead of disorder. I, um, I realize now that that changed the whole way I reacted with the whole world. I mean, I was yeah. anxious before that. And I was really, I had OCD before that, I had pure OCD before that. Um, I had all of these neurotic behaviors I didn't realize as a kid you don't. Um, I grew up in quite a, quite a violent household. Wow. Actually around alcohol, because when alcohol wasn't involved, it was a lovely place to live. But when alcohol got involved, it was very violent. Um, so when I was 19, the drink problem started. Um, but it was very, very, very slow. So I started... I, I, the reason why we're making this film is because I feel like I came to the Sinclair, Sinclair method far too late. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that to happen to someone else who could be where I was 10 years ago. Because if I'd have found it 10 years ago, I think I would have, I would be able to drink sensibly today, which unfortunately I can't anymore. Yeah, let's talk about that. So you say you were a binge drinker. What did, what did that look like for you? And what did that mean to you? That would be every weekend. And this is not going to sound like I've even got a problem because I can't explain it in the way because at first I didn't for a long time. I didn't. Um, I, every Friday and Saturday I'd go out and drink far too much. Mm -hmm. And it was when I tried drinking beer about 11 years ago that it got bad and the OCD was getting really, really bad. So I would drink to just block the OCD problems out. And it's not just OCD touching things. When people say OCD, they think that they repeat repetitive behaviors, touch wood. I did all of that stuff, but it was, pure OCD so the pure thoughts I would get a thought in my head, a worry in my head and it would be the most obscure worry that's but I couldn't shake it it was like I was wearing it on the inside of my glasses and it was as soon as I opened my eyes I saw it I thought it and soon as, and I just couldn't wait to get to bed it exhausted me so I started drinking alcohol binging which was the only thing I knew had the only substance I've ever done I don't smoke I've never done any drugs um so I started to really heavily rely on it when I went to uni. It was about 11 years ago now. Um, so that's when it got bad. But that was in conjunction with the OCD, which, which was just getting worse and worse and worse through the years. Um, and then I went to AA when I was 27. And 
because it's hard to explain because I think I was a bit of a people pleaser then. So I think I thought I had a worse problem than I actually did. And when I went to AA, it actually made my problem worse because I don't think it was the appropriate place for me to go at that time. Had I known again about the Sinclair method, I would have tried that. But I didn't even hear about the Sinclair method until about eight months ago. And you're talking 10 years ago. Wow. So my, my, my message, you know, I really want to talk about in the film is that there's so many other things I could have tried before I got to the point where now if I have one drink, I'll have 12 drinks and I will, I will end up in a graveyard somewhere running around yeah. on a bench somewhere and I would do the strangest things I would never ever do if I wasn't drunk. But I wouldn't, but it didn't have to get that way. It didn't have to get there. And, and I really do believe the Sinclair method could stop a lot of people getting to that point. Yeah. So what, what was your Sinclair method experience like? You discovered it eight months ago. Um, you tried to get sober through AA before that. It didn't work. So what happened when you went on the Sinclair method? And when I first took the Sinclair method, or when I took the naltrexone here, um, it took me ages to get it, by the way. Um, it, it works right away. And we were actually even talking, I think, when we were, we've been speaking for a few months now. Mm. And I could feel it working straight away. The first time I took it, I had two beers and I felt full. I didn't feel a massive urge to get any more. I really didn't. And in my mind, I'm going, well, I'm, this is great. So I tried it again. And obviously there's the extinction method, which gave me hope. I thought, I'm going to drink myself sober. This will be, be hilarious. And um, it actually was working. I could feel it working. It was almost like it was just too late for me. I had an incident a few months back where I just drank right through that feeling of not wanting anymore. Then I realized actually this isn't just nothing to do. Well, it's not nothing to do in courses. It was to do with me wanting to, to self-destruct. Mm. I purposely drank through that as if it was a challenge. Wow. And that's <laughs> scary. That scared me because I'm like, even this that's helping hundreds of thousands of people around the world, who have drinking more than I'm drinking, who have drunk far more than I've drunk. I've never been a daily drinker. I've never drunk two bottles of wine a day, never drunk in the morning. I can still want to drink through that. That's something else. That's not to do with the drink. That's something I'm not a very happy person. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that actually I can't drink at all. Mm -hmm. I knew I, yeah, that this wasn't going to work for me, but not because it doesn't work, but because I wanted it. I didn't want it to work. Mm -hmm. I was in too much I was in it was too much pain for it to work mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be sober. Mm. I didn't want to drink one or two. I actually wanted to black out. Mm. So I think that's an important thing with this is if you want to black out, you'll black out. You'll get, you can't, I drank through it on purpose mm. and that really still to this day, but find <laughs> that really bizarre that I did it on purpose. That's self, that's, that's self harm. It absolutely is. And I think it's so important to speak to that because, you know, obviously I'm a huge advocate for the Sinclair method. And as you were saying, it, it works for so many people, but it's not going to work for everybody. And this instance, like you have experienced, this is why I wanted to have you on as well, to really educate people about this risk when you're going on the method. You know, sometimes I hear people say that the Sinclair method isn't really getting to the root of why someone's drinking and it's not a real cure for alcoholism. And so I don't, I don't agree with that. I feel like um, any type of reduction with alcohol, whether it's through abstinence or the Sinclair method, when you're getting that, that poison out of your system and you're using it less and abusing it less, um, you can really go within and do that work on yourself to understand why you're drinking. And I've seen people in your situation where they, they do intentionally sabotage themselves. They get that off signal, but they keep drinking anyway. And again, it's much deeper than, um, yeah, just like you're saying about the drink, it's more about what's going on within why am i so self sabot why am i sabotaging myself right now yeah so what was that um i want to talk about that experience more what was that like for you um kind of i guess drinking through the medication because it had been working for a few months for you you saw the results so what was happening in the time the day or whatever leading up to it that caused you to keep um, drinking beyond the medication, giving you that off signal not to? I think that's a really important question and something that I, I, I straight away asked. Um, I have a habit of over, 
how do you say saying yes when I want to say no and I have a habit of exhausting myself and we were talking just before this how many film projects I've got and they'll go I have a habit of um yeah exhausting myself absolutely exhausting myself and I'd done it again and I'd said a lot of yeses when I said I want to say no and I was in a place where I really didn't want to be people were not putting their weight when we were doing some filming and um I was getting frustrated and I also had in my mind well even if this day turns out terrible I can still get drunk so what led to it was me what really led to it was me not having any boundaries and not saying no and saying actually will you guys do what we had in the schedule will you guys stick to what we're doing why are you messing us around I have I'm only just starting to stand up for myself mm. and um that's what led to it poor ego boundaries poor um self uh, yeah self-awareness I suppose really really poor self-esteem um that's what led to me to binge because mm. instead of actually turning around and going, look, you guys, you're upset at me. This needs to stop. Well, you're not sticking to what we've agreed here. You're actually taking advantage of me. I ingested it or I ingested it. I internalized it. Um, and then I took it out on myself later on and everyone else around me. And then I did what I always do when I drink is I hide in the pub. I turn my phone off and I'll sit there and I'll talk to people I don't know mm. because I don't need to explain myself. Mm-hmm. And I hide in the pub. That's to me was exactly what happened, and it and that had to stop because I thought I could still do that behaviour and then have a break. The, the, the Sinclair method would provide me with a break, so I wouldn't go completely over. But then I even realised I'd drink through that. So yeah. clearly, something else had to had to help me create boundaries um, between myself and people that I feel like are taking advantage of me, or I'm allowing them to take advantage of me because most of the time they're not. I'm just saying yes when I mean no. Um, not take on too much. I need to understand why I behave a certain way, the way I, the why I see the world and my place in the world and my reaction to the way I think people are thinking about me. All of this needed to change. All of it. My whole idea of of what I thought I wanted for myself was wrong, or well, not even wrong. I just didn't know, and and I would get myself in such a exhausted, tired state that I'd hide in alcohol Mm -hmm. that's what happened that day and and when I woke up the next day I was so devastated that I kind of thought I'd found a solution to this for me and because I know it works for loads of other for many many other people I really was pinning my last bit of hopes on this that I could drink sensibly Mm -hmm. and now I know I, I just can't I can't do it it doesn't just affect me it's not the drinking it's it goes straight back to the old behaviors if I start drinking again Mm -hmm. um actually has very little to do with the drinking that's just opens the door to go back to behaving mm-hmm. ways. so yeah. i'm not sure if I answered your question or to be honest. yeah <laughs> yeah you did for sure um so like what what has this experience meant to you and taught you like i know because i've heard from other people who've had this type of experience where they go on the, the treatment plan or the Sinclair method, they take the pill, they think it's going to be this thing that's going to just prevent them, like it has no risk to it, they're, you're not going to overdrink on it. So I've seen people go this route where they're like surprised that, oh my gosh, I overdrink last night, I thought this pill was supposed to protect me. Um, but it does happen. And sometimes people will stick to the method and keep trying it out. And in your instance, you've told me several times, you're like, I just know that I can't drink again. I just know that about myself. So um, what gave you that realization, I guess? I think it's the reasons why I was drinking, I suppose, because I was drinking to black out. Mm-hmm. I don't really want to have a couple of drinks. I think a lot of people who go on the single method genuinely just want to be able to have a few drinks with their friends and go out and spend time with them. I don't. I want to hide in the pub on my own away from everybody. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't drinking to be social. That's actually the best way to put it. I was drinking to hide. So even if I could drink a couple, I wouldn't want to. And clearly I don't want to because I didn't when I could. And I had that feeling that night of I've had enough and I still carried on. Yeah. So I don't want to drink to have a couple. I want to drink to black out. So clearly that's, that, that's the reason I knew that you're not drinking. You don't like this anymore. You want to get drunk. You want to just black out. And 
only because you've led yourself during the day to get into that or over the last month i mean these these behands can start months before um and um i can i just need to get out of that cycle of creating those patterns that lead me up to want to black out drunk mm-hmm. i don't want i've never enjoyed alcohol it's it's not as if i've ever drunk because i like the taste of it um it's not as if i've ever drunk because i see this is the other thing i don't drink at home very rarely drunk at home i don't sit down and watch the tv and have four or five cans of beer in the evening i wouldn't drink unless it got me drunk so why would i because i don't really like the taste of it so i'm clearly drinking to get drunk so if i'm taking a tablet that stops me from getting drunk i've actually got no enjoyment because i don't even like the taste of it so i realized i i I want to get drunk Mm I don't want to go, how's that? That's not the right way to put it. I don't want to get drunk, but every time I pick up a drink, I intend on getting drunk. Mm-hmm. That's when I, so I knew it was about drink, about getting drunk, not about drinking. And I'm sure you've gone over this in your head and not to dwell on like what could have been, but do you feel like they're like for people watching for perhaps who might have the same drinking patterns you do of just infrequent binges, but when they happen, they go really deep. Um, is there something you could have done, do you think, to make the Sinclair method work for you in this case? Or as you said earlier, were you to, like it maybe it worked, would have worked for you 10 years ago, but by the time you're at now, you're not sure. Is there something in all the reflection you've done the past few months since this happened that you feel like you could have done to prevent that from happening? I think the only thing that you said I could think of is that if I'd had this maybe four or five years ago, it would have worked. I think my lifestyle now is that I'm, you know, I'm 38 now. I want to have a family. I want to, I've got a mortgage. I'm building a business. It doesn't really fit in my lifestyle right now. But if I was single and I was living in my own place and I wanted to go out at night and I had a more reason to want to go out and socialize more, then yeah, I would probably still be on the single method mm-hmm. because the night does work. But I actually don't need it, I need to do the drinking anymore. Um, Saying that, it's really hard to, to be a filmmaker and travel around and up and down the country and there's alcohol everywhere. And this is the sort of industry where a lot of people drink and, and a lot of people have substance abuse, misuse disorders. Um, so I think if I had had this three years ago, four years ago, I would have chanced a lot better chance of, I think it would have worked. I think I could have moderate, moderated my drinking because then I was in drinking because I enjoyed it more. Whereas in the end, the last three years, I was drinking because I really wanted to just black out. I didn't want to get... I didn't want to have a few beers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my 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 reasons for drinking changed. Yeah. That's therefore my pat my 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 need to stop changed. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, it does. So, what's your view of the Sinclair method now? I think it's it's a lifesaver, and I think it's something that that we like. I say we wanted to make I wanted to make this documentary because I think that it's something that should be introduced very a lot earlier on than it should do it should be far more wildly widely known or wildly widely known um it should it's something that could save millions of lives absolutely millions of lives and and not just that it can it can also have a knock-on effect of people getting into counseling psychotherapy quicker using mindfulness, using Buddhism we're look, looking into. It can, it can stop, it can calm down the storm before it really rips through your life. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to get as far as I've got. And I mean, I'm lucky. I mean, I didn't drink very often. Mm-hmm. I'm not a person who, who drunk every day. I'm not, I've got a friend of mine who's, we went to university together. Lovely guy, he's a filmmaker himself, incredibly talented. And I knew, and this is quite funny because I knew at uni, when I started to go to AA, I mentioned to this guy, so I'll go to AA, I said, I don't drink anymore. He went, what are you going to AA for? You ain't got, you're not an alcoholic. I said, I don't know, I might be. Um, I've definitely got a drink problem. And I knew he had a drink problem, but his hadn't progressed. Mm-hmm. But I knew he had the same mind that I did. We both had pure OCD. We both worried chronically about whether we upset people or not. Mm-hmm. We were both chronic people pleasers. And I knew they had the same mind that I did. We used to even create the same sort of filmmaking content. It was always a bit dark and bizarre, a bit odd. Um, so I knew he was like me. Well, now, poor sod, he's in a, he, he's in a hostel. He's, he's drinking every day. He's, he's chronic, alcoholic. Um, I haven't, he's, we kind of got in, 
in a road and he's gone that way and I've managed to just curtail it, but I was heading that way. Mm -hmm. Um, We both have the same mind. I think it does have a little bit to do with creativity. It does have a little bit to do that, but also his is from trauma as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And and something I would like to say is that I think a lot of addictions are born from a post-traumatic stress disorder event. Mm -hmm. Um, I really, really think that's something that needs to be, needs to be looked at more is that there's a traumatic event that happens and not clearly the more you drink the more, the more you black out the more traumatic events are going to happen the more you'll want to drink um that makes total sense to me it's quite logical i'm not one of the ones that buys into born with an alcoholic brain i don't i think that's too damning i don't see that i can't see that's helpful i, I mean I, I just don't see yeah. that doesn't make that that doesn't ring true with me that really doesn't. I don't think I was ever born with an alcoholic brain. I think I was born. I was. I grew up in a very uh, scary environment, mm. a very violent environment. I was around alcohol every weekend that caused violence. I went through some traumatic events that caused me to, to go for the first thing that I knew that everybody else was grabbing hold of, um, and then I became reliant upon it. And that's quite logical, mm-hmm. completely logical. And this guy was the same, and I saw his timeline yeah was the same so i think the sinclair method could have helped him 10 years ago because i've seen him completely rocket past me in his alcoholism mm-hmm. um and he to me and he's admitted he's an alcoholic it's not as if i'm putting that upon him yeah. um i think anyone who's got an alcohol use he's got alcohol use disorder and i didn't even know what that term meant until you explained it to me <laughs> i got that mixed up with dui for ages i was thinking <laughs> how does that fit round? so i I was like, how can I use this sort of, well, that makes sense. That's what I had up until about three years ago. And um, I think anyone with an alcohol use disorder, the Sinclair method can be the answer. hundred percent that can be the answer for the alcohol part. Then I would suggest you go see a psychotherapist and a counselor, maybe try work mindfulness, find something that you like doing behaviors will need to change. Maybe the environment you, you spend your time in your friend set might need to change. Um, things need to change, but to do with the alcoholism part and that chronic craving after the one drink, I think the the, the Sinclair method. There's a reason why it's not known without getting con- too, too conspiratory um, about it. And we, um, there's a reason why it's not known. And it, in in people, the medical profession deals with. It, it, does it look for a cure, or does it look to st- to keep people? Not, I don't mean the people within it. Mm-hmm. Of course they don't. But there's a lot of money to be made out of big pharma. Mm-hmm. So therefore you need ill people. Mm-hmm. So the Sinclair method, I think, on a level, probably cures too many, too, too many alcoholism people. Alcoholism leads to so many other diseases as well. I mean, it's just, there's a direct correlation. So yeah, without going into any conspiracy or whatever, but yeah. But there is a conspiracy in, in that sense because... If it's if they're saying they're doing one thing and they're doing another, that's conspiratory, and in that that clearly is. Um, so, yeah, as you say, it leads to other diseases. It leads to other things. Keeping people ill is a business, and the Sinclair method um, gets people well. I think I heard this said about the smart smart recovery. Mm-hmm. The reason why there's millions of people in AA but not millions of people in smart recovery is because people in smart recovery get better mm. and they need it. So they leave. That makes yeah. total sense to me. But AA people in AA stay, stay in AA for well, not everyone, but major many of them stay in AA for the rest of their life. I'm in AA. Doesn't I'm not bashing AA yeah. um, at all. I love it for what it is, but I wouldn't. Rem- I definitely would not rem- recommend it to anyone who is having a binge drinking problem for six months to go to AA. That's. I think that's that can be quite dangerous. Yeah. In my opinion. I think that that's to me in my experience at 25 years old, 26 years old, going into AA was dangerous for me. It caused, it, it, it exasperated my drinking problem because when I relapsed after six months, I felt so bad about it. Oh. I never went back until another seven months. And then I went back on and off for about three years. One there, one once there, maybe I'd get another six weeks. I felt so bad about it. I didn't know what was wrong with me. It confused me. But if someone had said to me, is a Sinclair method. This all could tell your drinking. That would have made far more sense to me. Mm-hmm. So, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I've even answered any of your questions. That I've told. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. You said you love AA for what it is. So, and you are also you also see the other side of it, which is the side that people don't love as much, where it's dogmatic, it's very mm. rigorous. Um, to me, it made me feel just kind of disempowered and a little bit more shameful than I already did. So, what is it that you love about AA, and how do you make it? work for you and I, yeah what's your recovery like now where are you at because I know you stopped drinking two months ago and you're going yeah. sober um so yeah just why do you love AA um how does it work for you and where are you at recovery now I am um, uh, actually something in AA really struck with me and actually it was about a job I started doing recently that a part-time job I couldn't stand and someone said to me well if you don't like the environment of the job leave the environment don't try and change the job because it will stress you out. It's that's the way it is there. So I left. Um, I didn't really need the job, luckily. But it, it, there's a big story behind that. Um, not big story. I just I just <laughs> the same old behaviours. But with AA is the same. So I've gone back into AA with the idea of this is how it is. I'm going to from go in and use it for what. I believe it'll work for me and then I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to try and change it. I'm not going to try and pick it apart because that's the way it is. And who, what right do I have to go in there and try and change it for these millions of people that it's worked for? There's loads of stuff in there I think are, is absolutely bizarre, but there's loads of stuff that seem, well, I'm, I haven't drunk for two months. Um, although that's not unlike me, but I feel far more calm. And we were talking just before, we, we spoke about when I did this step four and I, I never get these steps right. I can never remember what order they're in the, um, what would they call it? The inventory. Yeah. And, um, I looked at everything, these resentments I had and, um, fears, and they obviously correlation and relationships go into each other. And you look in your part and what I realized from it was that I was incredibly sad. Instead, I, w I was not angry. I was frustrated that led to anger, but I really under the base core, I was so sad about my ch childhood, mm -hmm. about growing up in, in, in a violent environment. And I was a very ill child. I haven't even mentioned that, but I was in and out hospital all my life. For, for, I didn't have an esophagus when I was born. Wow. So oh I had to go in and out Great Ormond Street for years and years. So that caused anxiety. Um, so I was just sad about all of this stuff, sad about all the relationships that failed, sad about some of the stuff I said when I was drunk and some of the stuff was said to me. And once I realized it was sadness, then I've, I felt so much calmer these last couple of weeks mm. because it's, I can deal with sadness. I can understand sadness. The sadness is acceptance, but I didn't know what it was. So therefore I was getting frustrated and anger, angry. And that's what AA has given me. Mm. But I will say that I've been going to counseling that's actually been doing the same thing alongside it, which has helped me sort out my boundaries. Yeah. Say no when I mean no. Actually say what I mean and not take on too much um that's helping yeah so there is a lot about aa that is great but i i need to use it for me alongside of other things it won't on its own it'll only do so much yeah um but it is what it is it's helped a load of people um but i think people look for a black and white answer in things don't they, they is it good is it bad well i really can't tell what you tell you what you're going to get out of it until you go to it yeah i can't tell you i don't know that it's helping me at the moment but there may become a day that i don't go back i just don't, I just don't think i need it anymore i like the people there so i'd probably just go back because i like the people but um i don't think the language helps in aa i don't think the way it's written helps but it was written in in is it a place called for the oxford group in as a christian christian group in 19 late 1930s i mean the language is clearly not going to be it's not going to, it's not going to go so well with young people today. It's just not. Um, and I think even Bill Wilson, and I, I don't know if I'm, if I've made this up or I read about this, that he even said later on that we need to be more inclusive of other faiths, beliefs and systems of understanding and working. And, and, and the rigidness of AA is what is, is going to be, is, is its downfall. It's that it even says in the book that, and I've highlighted this to point this out was, it says that the medical profession has not, or medical science hasn't found a cure for it not um, yet. It may well do one day, but as for as yet, it has not. Well, 1940, 1939, or even the revised versions, it hadn't. 
but it has now. It's called the Sinclair method. It's called his other methods. So he was even open to the down the future. Mm-hmm. That this actually might be sorted. This might actually get some other help. And I think people miss that because they don't want to hear that. So there is a cult like mentality of of course there is. I mean you don't mm-hmm. you don't have to I mean I don't have to point that out. There is. Mm-hmm. But I love it for what it is. I think it's it's a tool in a box mm-hmm. that you can use. But I do think as if you've got alcohol use disorder and you're not chronic alcoholic, there's many, many other options. And that's why we wanted, I spoke to you about making this film. Mm -hmm. Let's try and give people the opportunity not to get to chronic alcoholism (laughs) or, or to the point where I am, whereas I know I can't drink safely anymore. And it's a shame because I'd love, I think a few years back, I'd love to have been able to, Mm -hmm. it just caused too much problems and pain now to, to even go back. Yeah, where are you at now? Um, are you still taking the naltrexone for anti-craving or where are you at in your, how are things for you? Yeah. Um, I take, I suppose to take it. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if it helps it. though. I think you were yeah. saying recently, you're like, it's not helping. <laughs> I don't think it really makes any difference to me. I don't get daily cravings to drink. That's true. I get cravings to hide away and run away from things. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing other things to make sure I, I very rarely feel like that. And when I feel like that, I just have to stop. Mm-hmm. and just leave leave things alone or hide, hide away in another way um but no i don't i don't take the naltrexone anymore because i don't really get cravings but i'm yeah. i've been told it helps with cravings so if someone th- is still feeding cravings then i'd suggest you do what the doctor says and take it <laughs> but I, I don't i've never had a never been one for having loads of cravings for alcohol i've had cravings to disappear into the pub and get absolutely hammered but i've never had cravings to have a drink just one drink it's never really been like that for me which yeah. is is was the baffling thing for me I could probably understood that a little bit more but yeah. I didn't really understand what my drinking problem was if and, and I, I still don't understand it to this day it's such a strange one so yeah anyone anyone who drunk as much as I drank would probably think they didn't have a problem but I knew I did mm-hmm. because the way I did it mm-hmm. and again that's another thing in the film alcoholism to me is the way you drink the reaction you have once you have one you can't stop but alcohol use disorder and alcohol dependency are all different things i think they may all be all one person may have all of them yeah. but i did never had out i was never alcohol dependent yeah i never drank to get through the day i never drank at work i never drank in the mornings it's it's Bizarre how I became an alcoholic. And actually, my friend was saying that we were doing a film yesterday. He's, he's, he works with me. And we've always had a drink together. And I said, isn't it bizarre how I became an alcoholic? And he didn't. Because his dad, his, his dad has, a, has an issue with it. And, um, and he said, yeah. He said, it's strange because he still likes a couple of beers, but he stops afterwards. But he wasn't almost like that. Hmm. And I, I still, to this day, I have no idea why it happened to me and didn't. I don't know. How are your thoughts about that? How do you see that? Because I don't understand it, if I'm honest. Well, I can relate so much with what you're saying of it just being a coping mechanism mechanism to really run and hide from things, because I think that's a lot of why I used it too, though I used it daily, but I was, I was hiding every day and wanting to escape my reality every day. And then with that, um, alcohol made me really weak because um, it just made me lose my confidence. It made me not clear. It made me feel not embodied or grounded in myself and so it just kept that vicious cycle perpetually going where I didn't have any healthy coping mechanisms alcohol was my coping mechanism and the more I leaned on it the the weaker it made me hence the spiral out of just the alcohol dependence getting worse so and I think you know sometimes people say that the Sinclair method isn't a real treatment because you're not getting to the root of why someone's drinking but like you're talking about with the going to AA and doing your therapy um when I think about the 12 steps of AA, like it's really just going within and doing the inner work on yourself, whether that's through AA and 12 steps or a psychotherapist or spiritual retreats or meditation or whatever works for the individual. Um, I feel like there, that opportunity is there for people going on the Sinclair method. Yeah, you're taking a medication, but um, for me, that was like the, the training wheels to get me boosted up and stable enough, not craving alcohol enough to start doing that inner inquiry. Um, so yeah, just, just really relate with what you're saying about it being a coping mechanism. And I, 
I don't know why either it happens to some and others, but I think to what you were saying about it, um, yeah, just being your go-to and wanting to hide and allowing yourself to be um, kind of pushed around by people. Cause I relate to that a lot too. Like I was super nice person that everyone really liked, but it was to my own detriment because I'd have to go home and drink every night just to cope with that, the weight that comes with that. And so it's not, you hear people say, you know, it's not about the substance really. Like that's just the effect of whatever cause is someone is, is going through that's driving them to drink, which I think we are, we're similar in that where, um, yeah, the weight of the world, the weight of the, the trauma from childhood that may have not been dealt with yet. Um, it just keeps coming back until you really process it. And when you're dependent on alcohol, you can't ever really fully process that stuff. So I always felt stunted. Yeah, I think I've, one of the analogies I come up with is, do you remember all these old um, train carts when they were back in the I think early 900s, they used to pump it? Yeah. And they used to go along. Well, this is what alcohol was like for me. It was like, because I was a people pleaser, I'd be pumping that thing to keep the train going. And there is a point where you can slow down and stop that if you learn how to. But there was a point where I just snapped the handle off. And that's where I'm at now. There's just absolutely no putting the handle back together. And But you don't need to get to that stage. And I think, as you said, Sinclair Method, all of these other things, Buddhism, mindfulness, psychotherapy, counselling, can stop you before you snap the handle off. Mm -hmm. And you can no longer drink safely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can even push that to the point. I mean, I know people that are still doing the Sinclair method and actually reverting backwards mm -hmm. um, because they still enjoy a couple of drinks. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's amazing. Um, but for me, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to work and I don't really want to drink. Yeah. I just don't want to feel the way I, I felt then. It's such a personal decision too. I feel like, you know, whether or not someone has an alcohol problem. I've had people ask me on my channel, you know, were you a real alcoholic? Cause I was drinking a bottle of wine every day, but I still had my life together. Like an alcoholic in our mind is someone who's everything's kind of gone to shit or whatever, but it's such a personal decision. Cause I can drink a bottle of wine a night and be totally unhappy with that while somebody else, they're totally fine and they don't want to make a change. And so um, it's such a personal decision, I think. And yeah, like you've said, some people might not know or think you had a drinking problem because you drank so infrequently, but you know what was really going on for you when you were drinking and why you were doing it. And it was a real tool for self-sabotage. Yeah, I think, as you just pointed out there, look at your, if you think, if you feel like, I suppose if you, if you think you might have a problem, look at your internal dialogue when you're having a drink. Are you struggling to not to stop when you, you would like to? Just look at the dialogue that's going on in your head because to me, I would be arguing in my head, running away from the next drink. I'd be planning how to get out or planning how to stay in. It was exhausting. It wasn't pleasant. Mm -hmm. but I was still doing it to myself. So that's probably a sign that you might have a problem with it. If you look at the dialogue in your head, is that a healthy dialogue or are you yeah. having an argument in your brain? Um, that'll probably give you an indication of how, how much of an issue it is for you. But as you say, it's a it's a real real personal thing and that's why i think aa struggles but i understand the why why it is the way it is you got to think it was set up by chronic alcoholics people that were drinking daily all the time that were actually on death's door in prison but you see people come into aa that are nowhere near along them lines that could have other help mm -hmm. but i still would say go to AA, but just try other stuff or say along Along, I, I wouldn't say go in if you're having a six months problem with it. But if it's something you really struggle with for a long time, then 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 try it. But I don't know. It's it's a it's a real hard one because you don't want to give anyone. I know what I'd be like if I would have watched a video six years ago and someone would have said to me, "You don't have to go to AA. You probably haven't got a problem," or even hinted at that. I'd have run with that. So I don't want to say to them, "You haven't." I, I really won't know. Oh, I won't know if you've got a problem because I can't too. I don't know the dialogue in your head. I, I really don't. No one knows the dialogue in your head. Only you'll know that. Mm -hmm. um, that's the decision you need to make yeah. yourself. Um, but there are other options. And that's what so the film that we're doing together. I want to do a 90 minute documentary. It's out on Amazon. It'll be out later this year. And I want it to be a, a film that you can watch and go, okay, these are, there's probably about eight or nine methods here I can try. I can mix and match. I could try a bit from here, I could try a bit from there, and it might work at one point in my life, it might not. But then six years later, it might work again. 
I can mix and match these points, but AA and abstinence, not not AA, AA is just a brand name. Abstinence mm-hmm. is, to me, is an extreme thing to aim for if you've got a problem. Mm-hmm. That's a heavy, heavy weight. Mm-hmm. That, ter- that, that didn't even terrify me. It was just like, I know I'm going to fail at this. Mm-hmm. When you're really down on your knees, do you nearly need another thing to fail at? Give yourself half a chance. Um, and try these other things. Mm-hmm. I mean, by all means, try and stay away from it for a while because it will help you clear your head. Yeah. But is this a heavy thing to do? It's a hard thing to do. And and also the language in the AA book, in the, in the big book, is confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know if it's supposed to be understood, <laughs> if I'm honest, <laughs> because it's like some of that is quite... But again, have a sense of humour about it when you go along. That's a real, real help. It's a healthy sign if you're laughing about something no. and there's a real healthy sign that you've not been you've not taken it too seriously um i find it really funny i still find that the prayer at the end of the i don't know if you ever did that your one but you'll no. stand up hold hands and do the serenity prayer i mean i still find that really funny but i do it but out of respect for everybody else in there and that's the way it is and it's a small price to pay to get your ego out of the way to do that but i still find it funny yeah. and i know that I know that I'm still attached to some sort of sanity if I find that funny, because to me it is funny. It's a bizarre thing to do. It's really bizarre. I, I start, it's really odd. It's the pitch and tone as well. Yeah. Of the, everybody says the prayer and this really low down deep thing. No, 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 mumble in it. And I'm like, this is, I want to try and, can we sing it? <laughs> Put some, a bit of a range in this. And I just find it really odd. And I was saying to my sponsor that, and he started laughing. He was like, yeah, I felt the same thing as well. It's like, I knew you did. <laughs> You're going to sing it next time, aren't you? I do. Oh. I sometimes go like a little half an octave above. But then I start to laugh like a little bit. So I do look, try and harmonize a bit with it just to see what happens. And I know that if I'm doing that, I've still got a healthy understanding of it. But alcoholism is, 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 is this issue is baffling. But yeah really really baffling isn't it it's but why it's everywhere yeah i mean i I once said to someone if i were if i was a if i was addicted to cocaine oh king i'm too lazy to be addicted to cocaine because you have to go and find it (laughs) but alcohol is everywhere the only way i think i'd get addicted to cocaine is they sellotaped it to like trees or lampposts and i could pick up a packet on the way to the shops (laughs) because i'm far too lazy to bother I'm not dedicated enough. That's the one. So alcoholism is a really easy thing to get addicted to, isn't it? Oh, alcohol, sorry. I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think it was one point, I don't know if in your country, but in this country, they, we had lollies. Alcohol, lo- they call them alcohol pops. It was lollies. Like alcohol suckers? Pops. Yeah, lollies. Oh, no, but not, you like, ice lollies. Oh my alcohol. God. They might, we might nowadays, but yeah, because I see it more and more everywhere as well. And it's so socially acceptable as how you celebrate. It was, it was so confusing for me when I was addicted and it was getting really bad toward the end because I'm like, but we're going out to happy hour to party. Yet somehow every time I take it way too far and it's just this confusing experience where I'm like, what is, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Did you feel like that? Like you were kind of some sort of leper. I always felt like a bit of a leper. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, yeah. And I was, I remember asking as like the, the Sinclair method for me is the craving started to be removed and the chatter about next drink, next drink, next drink. I was asking people about this, like, do, does this happen to you when you drink where you're just like obsessed about the next drink? And like my husband, like, no, like I'm just drinking it to enjoy it. And I'm like, okay, that's the difference. <laughs> that's, the difference. that's it. That's where you fit the nail on the head, isn't it? What I said earlier about the, the talk in your head, yeah. I'll tell you if you've got a problem with it. Yeah. Because that's exactly what mine was. As soon as I had one, the, the argument in my head would just be, oh, God, it wouldn't be worth it. That, to me, may, maybe that's how alcoholism is. That's, yeah. that's, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I don't know. But the Sinclair method, I think, is incredible. And it needs to be far spread far and wide. And it could save millions of lives. Yeah. And I'm hoping this film will go a lot, even do, even if it helps 1% of that mm-hmm. even if it just it, it highlights it a tiny bit the yeah. work that you're doing the work that claudia is doing that's how i found the sinclair method 
and I've passed it on to friends yeah and they're, they're looking into it and that's how this happens isn't it um and I want to recognize you because I was just interviewing a, an addiction specialist physician a couple of weeks ago and his advice to people who are struggling with any kind of addiction is to be your own best advocate and take your recovery into your own hands, insist that the doctor treats you in the way you want to be treated. And if they're, they're not able to, then go to another doctor just to absolutely not settle. And I feel like that is exactly what you're doing. You're taking your recovery into your own hands and, and applying different methods that can work for you. It's not about this one approach and this is the only way for everybody. You're you're taking what works for you in AA and you're leaving the rest. You're taking what works at your psychotherapy and leaving the rest. And I think that's um I think that's like just a, a real way to get better is to take it into your own hands and not surrender as a victim to something else and let someone else have the power over you, but to to go yeah within yourself enough and take it into your own hands to do what's going to what's going to work for you and what feels right for you. So I think it's, it's amazing to watch you go through this process. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gump, I do do an alcohol, I do al my vlog on my web, um, my YouTube page called alcohol ran me over. And, and um, I do like just every couple of days, I just do an update on, on them. Um, and then really it's just for me and for the documentary to be honest, but it's, it's something that, that it just helps. And like we all do, we do, this yeah. is therapy for us, isn't it? Yeah. Talking. Is therapy at part of AA is therapy connecting talking and um, it's all about just just purging this out of our system yeah um, we all need to remind we have to support each other and remind ourselves that that um that we're all trying to do the same thing we're all mm -hmm. trying to stop hurting we're all trying to stop being pain why are we arguing over methods of recovery <laughs> if we're all trying to do the same thing surely you'd be happy with me if I, happy for me if I stopped drinking if it was the fact, I mean, if I cut off my fingers and that stopped, stopped me drinking, you need to be happy for me because that's my method of recovery. Yeah. I wouldn't suggest that <laughs> at all. Um, although that stopped you picking up a glass, wouldn't it? Um, I think it depends. I don't understand the argument in this. this I've never understood it. Like yeah. my meth, my recovery isn't going to affect your recovery. Right. We, we're always trying to stop doing such something. Such a personal experience. Yourself. Yeah. And um, I think work that we're doing, that you're doing, that Claudia is doing, um, Dr. Sinclair has done. Um, I think people like Russell Brand's done an incredible job of trying to at least reword it. Mm -hmm. um, are doing some just little bits. What can you add to, instead of just arguing about it, what can you add to help? Yeah. Because what can you, you what other method can you, what bit of advice can you go mm -hmm. give? to someone who's going to help them and that's not don't do this do that mm -hmm. because i mean there is a there's a thing called recovery from recovery podcast and I've, I've listened to them and i think you can get addicted to recovery yeah if you're not careful i mean fight club was about addiction to addiction programs 12-step programs uh -huh. completely see that happening um 100 see that happening yeah um so yeah you, it's it's a funny one though isn't it but but maybe um i don't know i always found this funny in aa as well is that they say it's a day at a time but then they give you a chip for every month i never got couldn't get my head around that it's like well surely i should get a chip every day then <laughs> the same one over and over again do you know what I mean? Logic just throw in the recycle bin <laughs> just give me another one it didn't make sense just put it out of one pocket in the other that things like the logic didn't yeah. make any sense but AI is as it is, and I wouldn't suggest you go in there and start questioning it because if it's not for you, then try something. There's many, many other options, and and I'm as as um, I don't know. There's a good book. There's some good books out there as well. The Alcohol Lied to Me is a very good book by Craig Beck. That's we we'll hope to get him in the film actually. That's a very, very good book. That changes your way of looking at alcohol mm -hmm. and looking at the advertising of alcohol. Um, have you read of the unexpected joy of being sober? That's a good book as well. I was just, she has a blog and I was just reading that. Um, I haven't read the book yet. It's good though. Yeah, it's good. I've just finished reading that. She might be in the film as well. Oh, um, that's great. Well, she suggests she's, um, yeah, she said that she might be interested in being in it, in it. So we're trying to reach out to all of these people to talk about their methods. Cause she only went to AA for about six months and now she's done other stuff. Mm. Mindfulness. I think she's done and she started jogging seems to be one that works really well for people. Exercise in general. 
Exercise now you can get good. addicted to that. <laughs> yeah, no. So. Big Orexia. I hate jogging. Absolutely. Yeah. Hate jogging. <laughs> It's not for you. It's not I for won't me. try to force you, even though it's part of my recovery journey. It might not work for you, and I understand. No, it <laughs> probably turn you into it back if you call me jog, because it's horrific. It's not a good sight. I tried to. I live near the beach, and I tried jogging. It's, it's three minutes down there and back. I lasted about six weeks. I just I was like, this isn't. No, I don't don't enjoy this. I'm not doing doing it. And that's another thing is that. Um, I think people get mixed up with um, punishing themselves and how, how um, they, they see how good they're doing in life of how much pain they can, they can suffer, they can endure. So how long have I gone sober is one of them. Not what's the quality of my sobriety. Yeah. Or how long have I, I've stuck at this for ages, this job I hate. Look how well I've done. No one's going to pat you on the back for being miserable for a long time. Get out. Yeah. It, it's a bizarre thing. It's like, how long can I endure pain? That's not a sign of, of how well you're doing in life. That's a sign of carrying on doing the same thing. It's utter yeah. madness. But again, psychology just it's mixed it around. So it's really important to look at why you're doing things. Are you doing it to prove a point? I went to AA to prove a point for a long time. Many, many times. And I didn't even want to be there. Wow. But that's why it's to get it. So, and now you're doing it for different reasons. You're doing it to more, like you're more focused on the intention behind it as, as healing or how is it different for you now? I think, um, I realize it's the behaviors that led to it that I don't want to keep doing, mm. not the drinking. The drinking was the end result as I think most people have, mm-hmm. can understand that, that I don't want to carry on repeating these same behavioral traits and behavioral cycles because mm-hmm. it's not getting me anywhere in 10 years. I probably a lot further down the line, a lot of things I want to do. Yeah. Than I'm doing. So I don't want to just keep treading more. I'm 38. I'm getting a bit bored of it. So I kind of want to do something and, and I'm, yeah. So I, I kind of, I want to achieve things now. Yeah. So. And I think that's, that's an important, difference. that's an important point that, you have to have a goal that's bigger than the alcohol dependence or the need for the addiction to keep perpetuating. And that's something that I personally have had to kind of define and, and work toward in getting sober um, and going on the Sinclair method. And I think that's where people can get tripped up sometimes on the method where they stall or they see a lot of progress and then they stop for a while because they don't have a bigger reason, you know, why not to drink like something bigger to live for. Um, so I think that's important that you spoke to that. I think that's really important. I mean, I, I, and to ask yourself the, the crucial question is because if you've been drinking so long, you might have made, you might not know if you're making a decision for yourself or to someone else because you might not. I, you, I did. I made a lot of decisions in business jobs. I've done everything that I actually thought I wanted for myself, but I didn't. I was actually always trying to approve a point. Mm-hmm. So really, really slow down and go, do I want this for myself? And actually, do what do I want? I might not know. I might be in my four, mid-40s. And I actually don't know what I ever wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I don't know because I made every decision I ever made was to avoid pain. Mm-hmm. And usually it's to people please. I admit we talked about we're people pleasers. So we make decisions on how best to avoid pain. Mm-hmm. So right down to the people that you end up being in relations with, where you live, the job you do, mm-hmm. all about avoiding pain. And when you realize that, you think, actually, I'm making every single decision about avoiding pain. I don't know what I want to do with my life. Like I do, I know I wanted to be a filmmaker, Mm. but there's times when I don't know. At times, that's only the only constant. Mm. But as you say, you need a bigger purpose, but you need to need to know really crucially whether it's your purpose or not. Mm. I mean, like, what did you find out that was your purpose that kind of keeps you going? I mean, honestly, this like getting the message out about this new method for overcoming alcohol dependence because I really feel and this is something that's come as I've kind of gotten out of the alcohol fog but just seeing how much alcohol was holding me down um I couldn't experience true joy or true love like love of myself and love of things around me because it just kept me numb to that and I was feeling ill with hangover so often that it just it literally kept me trapped 
And so now that I've been free from that and I see the difference, um, I just, I want to help others get unstuck from that trap that is alcohol addiction. Because I think for a lot of people, we're functioning, we're drinking the bottle of wine a night, uh, yet we're functioning, but life has no meaning. We're not plugged into the truth of who we are. We're just kind of existing. And I think a lot of people are stuck in that and want to get out of that. And I don't even think like the Sinclair method gives you the option to be that moderate drinker. If you want to drink a couple drinks a week and, you know, follow the method, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but it's that trap of being addicted to it. And so I've become really passionate about helping people get out of that trap essentially. Um, and, and yeah, get to know themselves, uh, go on a healing journey. So that's been my, um, with my work, I'm really passionate about, yeah, getting the message out about this. So it drives me to keep creating content for the channel and I work with Rhea Health and I feel like they're gonna make a really big impact um, to be able to offer this treatment, you know, nationwide in the US from home for people with the counseling support and the medication support. And um, yeah, I mean, alcoholism in women in the last decade from 2002 to 2012, it's gone up about 84% women with alcohol use disorder. So it's it's a prevalent problem. And I think um, a lot of people don't know what to do about it. All we know is AA. That's all I knew was AA and rehab. So it prevented me from getting the treatment or the help that I needed because it was nothing I could ever relate to or commit to long term. So um, this is an alternative, I think, for people who are like me in that regard. I think it's incredible work. Um, we've connected on this, and it's amazing the journey that it takes you, doesn't it? Just connecting yeah. to people across the world on a similar journey. We all want the same thing, as we said earlier. But yeah, but yeah, I want to thank you for your work as well, and and for being part of this this documentary and. I always end up doing this. I end up interviewing you when I'm supposed to be interviewed. And I can never do this. I'm a terrible at being interviewed. I'm really, really not good at this. Part. You did a great job. So um, as we're wrapping up here, how can people find you, your Glitch in the Code podcast? I'll, I'll link your um, mm -hmm. vlog below where you're talking about your alcohol yeah. experience. Um, where else can people find you? Um, well, my Glitch in the Code will be glitchinthecode.co.uk, but that, that's my podcast. It's got a couple of bits of alcohol, about alcoholism in there, and I want to do a lot more as we're doing the documentary, but a lot of that's about conspiracy theories and love all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's about alternative ways of looking at the world, so it's not all about like spacemen and lizards and, and, that, and that sort of thing. But some of it is about how the media manipulates you, how social media manipulates your emotional and mental health. And some of it's about obviously about alcoholism and, and different ways of recovery. Um, so that's that's that one. Um, my yeah, If you just put the YouTube link below, they can follow my vlog on there. Every couple of days, I'll put a little video up of how I'm doing. Um, and then my documentaries is brickinthewallmedia.com, I believe. Brickinthewallmedia.com. There's all my documentaries I make on there, and this this film will be on there. There'll be some trailers coming out and teasers for this, and this film will be that we're making together will be on Amazon, um, and it'll be able to down to to stream it or rent it on Amazon come the end of the year, be a feature documentary, and I hope that this one will be the start of many other things. We haven't got a title for it yet, just know that it's going to be about the different methods, um, to recovery and and, and kind of like a toolbox of all these things you can use along your along the road um, and hopefully get you there before you get so desperate that you need to stay abstinent or even if you do need to stay abstinent there's options as well so so yeah they're the they're the they're the ones really um breaking the wall media glitching the code .co uk on my youtube channel um but any questions below anyone wants to chat to me I've, i'd love to speak to more people about this because mm. it's helping me as well helping me on, on my 11 year journey of recovery. And I think I just want to leave it just saying that recovery and abstinence are not the same thing. Reco mm. I've been in recovery for 11 years, but I've only been abstinent for, for two months, but I've also been abstinent in blocks of 16 months of six months, seven months regularly. I've done three or four months without drink. So probably within those 11 years, I've probably only drunk about seven or eight months at a time. Wow. Um, so recovery and abstinence are, complete, are two different things. Re recovery is a journey, and and um, and just because you you have a blip, if you want to call it that, or fall back a couple of days, doesn't mean you have to go back to the start of recovery. It's not like you've had you've suddenly lost all that knowledge and all that experience. Yeah, yeah. it's really important to know. 
because AA made me feel like that a little bit when I kind of you're back to, to step one. And I was thinking, how can I be back to step one? I've been here for six months. <laughs> like another surely. piece of the logic that doesn't resonate with you that you just okay. <laughs> but I still go. So if I can go and still and still like see some of the logic that doesn't fit with me, then I think a lot of people can get a lot out of it without having to live religiously by it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I love talking with you and you look forward to following your journey. I'll talk to you soon, Richard. All right. We'll take care. I'll speak Bye. to you soon. Bye-bye.